डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश आलिया यूनिवर्सिटी कोलकाता इट्स एन ऑनर एंड अ प्रिविलेज टू इंट्रोड्यूस प्रोफेसर स्कॉट स्लोविक हु विल स्पीक टुडे इन दिस प्लेनरी सेशन बट बिफोर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग प्रोफेसर स्लोविक आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स टू टर्न ऑफ देयर वीडियोज एंड keep their audios in mute mode i if you have any uh, question put in the chat box our moderators will read out the question on behalf of you one more request don't present screen now let's introduce professor slovi professor slovik is undoubtedly the most familiar face in the field known as eco criticism he is university distinguished professor at the university of idaho in the united states he served as founding president of the association for the studies in the uh, in literature and environment also known as asle from 1992 to 1995 and he edited isle in interdisciplinary studies in literature and environment the central journal in the field of eco criticism for asle and oxford university press for the last 25 years before completing his term at the end of this june professor slovik has published more than 300 articles in the environmental humanities and his 27 books include such works and seeking awareness in american nature writing and going away to think engagement or retreat and eco critical responsibility he co-edited rutledge handbook of eco criticism and environmental communication with indian scholars Swarnalata Rangarajan and Vidya Sarveswaran in 2019. And his three forthcoming co-edited books include Reading Cats and Dogs: Companion Animals in World Literature, Nature and Literary Studies: Cambridge Critical Concepts. and the bloomsbury handbook of medical environmental humanities he is also he is also the current editor of two book two book series rutledge studies in world literature and the environment and rutledge environmental humanities professor slovik is a four time Fulbright scholar having had grants in Germany, Japan and China. And with an fourth upcoming Fulbright in Turkey. Much of his current research and teaching focuses on critical studies, critical data studies. That is how information is collected communicated and received in the context of humanitarian and environmental crisis and he frequently publishes his work on the website www.arithmeticofcompassion.org uh now uh professor slovik would be speaking on contemplating pre uh, eco precarity during the 
कोरोना वायरस पैंडेमी चैलेंजेस एंड अपॉर्चुनिटीज इंक्लूडिंग द मेडिकल एंड एनवायरमेंटल ह्यूमैनिटीज आई वेलकम प्रोफेसर स्लोविक टू दिस प्लेनरी सेशन दिस सेशन विल बी मॉडरेटेड बाय डॉक्टर शर्मिष्ठा चटर्जी एंड हसीना वाइदा now uh, i will hand over the microphone to dr chatterji and hasina thank you thank you sofiel uh, and welcome once again uh, professor slovik uh, uh, i'll just set the backdrop in a few words uh, before uh, professor slovik uh, speaks on uh, his topic contemplating eco precarity during coronavirus pandemic challenges and opportunities in linking the medical and environmental humanities uh, uh there's indeed a deep and complex relationship between human health and the environment right now in light of the climate change the recent raging pandemic and other growing environmental issues securing health is one of the major challenges facing both humanity and the planet the aim is to explore how the humanities can be of value in understanding the challenges facing humans animals and the environment in relation to physical and mental health concerns posed by climate change environmental degradation and animal born diseases how have cultural products such as creative writing film music and visual arts drama non fiction narratives and news digital social and other media as well as the discourses of activism politics history medicine and religion changed understandings of environmental health crisis what insights do these cultural products offer into future possibilities for changing environment in the broader sense of patients families and communities affected by environmental diseases the environmental humanities are concerned with cultural products everything from architecture literature and non fiction writing drama music the visual arts film and other media to the discourses of activism politics history medicine and religion among others this attention to cultural products stems largely from the power to change environmental consciousness subtly and radically for better or for worse and to mobilize or silence communities cultural products often allow societies to envision alternative scenarios and to think imaginatively about implementing changes that enable adaptation increase resilience lessen fear modulate risk and to make competition for resources more manageable or at least less catastrophic in so doing cultural products give a particular insight into how societies communities and individuals understand environments and engage with environmental challenges climate fiction or cli-fi and any other kind of science fiction is the best gateway to science for many students literature has the potential to get the maximum number of students without intimidating them alienating them or boring them it is against this backdrop that we hear professor slovik today elaborating on and discussing the challenges that the emerging field of medical humanities faces from the pandemic today a very good morning to all of you and good evening to professor slovik i request you now please to kindly deliberate over to professor slovik <clears throat> Well, he hello, and thank you to our hosts at Alia University for organizing this event. Um, I'm speaking on Saturday evening in the Western American state of Idaho, sitting alone in my dining room at home, wondering who might be listening to this talk in Kolkata, India, and possibly other parts of the world. I understand that this is part of a series of talks on the subject of the planetary crisis and the humanities. but i find myself wondering which planetary crisis the series title refers to at this time in history we seem to be struggling with so many overlapping and intersecting crises uh social medical environmental economic and political crises as the saying goes we're facing a perfect storm and it's really hard to see how we're going to make progress in a practical sense in resolving the many challenges we're facing right now throughout the world 
It's also sometimes hard to see how the arts and humanities can play a useful role in providing something our fellow human beings need when we're all dealing with such dire and overwhelming problems as the COVID-19 pandemic, the loss of many jobs and the possibility of even more severe economic collapse, massive social unrest due to systemic racism and police brutality, and apparent political pandemic of rampant dictatorships or quasi-dictatorships erupting in many countries, even here in the United States, and on and on. And this is not even to mention the devastating environmental crises, from toxic pollution to extinction to the overarching threat of global climate change. The situation we're in in August 2020 is really as stressful and worrisome as any predicament I can remember experiencing in my lifetime. So where do we begin as we try to think about these planetary crises? Some of you may have heard a talk I gave in May uh, of this year at the online conference on imagining a post-coronavirus world hosted by Aro University. At that time, I suggested a number of potential responses to the coronavirus pandemic, mostly psychological responses, that I thought could be opportunities for people to learn something from that particular crisis, uh, but also perhaps from other varieties of crisis or layers of crisis we're experiencing at this time. I listed several examples in that earlier talk of what I called COVID mind, by which I meant ways of thinking inspired by the COVID crisis that might actually be beneficial to our ongoing survival as a species, enabling us to adapt to this world of worries and uncertainties. Specifically, I suggested that these psychological or cognitive tendencies might include the following. One, a sense of universal vulnerability. Two, a heightened awareness of the human mind's insensitivity to exponential and potentially catastrophic change. Three, a growing awareness that our interactions with the animal world have genuine consequences for human beings, as in the case of zoonotic transmission of disease. And four, an appreciation of what it means to put on the socio-cultural breaks and change the way we live. Again, these four ideas were, are points that I made in a talk I gave at the beginning of May, nearly four months ago. In today's talk, I wanted to dig more deeply into the specific idea of a universal sense of vulnerability which I've called eco-precarity in the title of my talk today, using the term developed by Professor Pramod K. Nayar from Hyderabad University. And I also wanted to, to talk a little bit today about the potential conjunction of the medical humanities and the environmental humanities, especially vis-a-vis -vis the COVID pandemic. In my earlier talk and in some other essays I've written over the summer, I have highlighted the strangely paradoxical psychological dimension of the pandemic, at least in my own experience, describing the paradox as one where I seem to be living my life these days in a dissonant condition of normalcy and peril. I know there are a lot of dangerous things out there in the world. In fact, there's a kind of implicit danger these days, even in standing too close to my neighbors and possibly sharing specks of contaminated bodily fluids merely by speaking to friends. To think this way is really strange, isn't it? And yet it's become the new normal for all of us. Eco-precarity is the idea accentuated by certain kinds of cultural texts that we live in a world where human beings and other living organisms are vulnerable to various threats. As Pramod K. Nayar, whom I'll discuss further in a minute, puts it, precariousness is the effect of an exposure to the world, which then inflicts injury. Again, precariousness or precarity is the effect of an exposure to the world, which then inflicts injury. 
and eco precarity emphasizes the need that our the idea i mean that the that our own vulnerability may be caused by threats from the natural environment and the idea that the environment itself may be vulnerable in various ways we started the new academic year at the university of idaho last week after months of fretting about whether or not the university would have in-person classes this fall or would move entirely to remote online teaching as many american universities have done i myself have never felt comfortable with the risk of resuming in-person classes at this time knowing that the threat of a major spike in covid cases continues to exist but the university administrators in Idaho have given in to political and economic pressures and have insisted on holding as many face-to-face -face classes as possible. However, they also created a new hybrid course delivery category called high flex classes in which professors can use their judgment in offering a mixture of in-person and virtual class sessions. I'm teaching my one high flex class this semester uh, via Zoom, and I do not intend to be in the same room as my students unless, by some fluke, there's a viable vaccine for the virus in the next three months. I am simply not willing to take the risk of being infected with COVID by one of my students or possibly sharing anything I've been exposed to with them. When I went to my office the other day for the first time in months, there was a plastic face shield waiting for me and for my faculty colleagues, but I don't plan to need the shield because I'll be teaching remotely and all of my faculty meetings will also be held remotely. This is all a response to my perception of the risk of COVID-19 and my unwillingness to behave in ways that seem reckless and unnecessarily dangerous. When I first wrote about the strange psychological balance between normalcy and peril that many of us have, are experiencing during the pandemic, we had only a few thousand known COVID deaths in the United States back in May. Today, when I checked, the Centers for Disease Control in this country said that we've had nearly 5.9 million cases in the United States and more than 181,000 deaths. India, I believe, has had nearly three and a half million cases and some 62,000 fatalities as of now. When I wrote uh, about this subject four months ago, I expressed surprise that there is a kind of normalcy to our lives, even in the midst of the COVID crisis. However, I also acknowledged at the same time, I find myself thinking about the peril of our species in a more acute and visceral way than was previously the case. Even though I know that the world in general is fraught with peril, with risk and danger, with uncertainty. I wrote uh, four months ago that it seems that we should carry away from the current moment the powerful idea that so-called normalcy and so-called peril coexist paradoxically in an uneasy tension. Today's paradoxical mindset should, I think, be part of what I call the COVID mind, a way of thinking that helps us to be sensitive to the serious threats we and others are facing in the world, even if we do not feel ourselves to be in immediate danger of suffering death or loss in a given moment. To me, normalcy, quote unquote normalcy, enables us to conduct our daily lives with a certain effectiveness. But peril should keep us on our toes, vigilant and concerned, knowing that we are all vulnerable. Some of the best thinking I've encountered on the subject of vulnerability is in the work of Professor Nayar, which I mentioned earlier. Pramod Nayar has published two recent books on different aspects of precarity, both from social justice and environmental perspectives. These are the 2017 book titled Bhopal's Ecological Gothic, Disaster, Precarity, and the Biopolitical Uncanny, and the 2019 publication Eco Precarity, Vulnerable Lives in Literature and Culture. The earlier book about Bhopal 
argues that the terrible union carbide chemical accident of 1984 has continued to haunt society for more than 30 years, characterizing Bhopali lives and perhaps stimulating public concern about the dangers of industrial society and the unethical practices of multinational corporations in externalizing the risks and costs of their activities. Nayar focuses in particular on the Gothic quality of the art and literature that have emerged from the 1984 disaster, a quality that results in a kind of unsettling psychological affect, a feeling of disquiet. This is a good thing, as I understand it, the way disaster texts, such as the tradition of Bhopal-related work, enables us uh, enable us to be concerned about an effect, an event that occurred long ago to people far away and enables us potentially to exert our voices, our economic actions, and our votes to prevent future such occurrences. The cultural representation of vulnerable Bhopali lives has the potential to create enhanced public awareness of an ongoing ecological and biopolitical threat. Nayar points to such artistic works as Indra Sinha's 2007 novel, uh, Animals People, as the chief examples of cultural texts <clears throat> that gothicize the Bhopali experience, <clears throat> creating an uncanny sensation for readers because the reality represented there is both familiar and strange. In this sense, in a sense, this uncanniness may be what I'm trying to explain <clears throat> when I speak about the simultaneous sense of normalcy and peril that characterizes my personal experience of the COVID pandemic so far. <clears throat> Nayar writes in Bhopal's Ecological Gothic that the Bhopal texts a folk foreground, a social ontology of the Bhopali, one that slides from vulnerability <clears throat> to helplessness or a state of precariousness. <clears throat> it is an ecosystem and ecology wherein precarity is the order of the Bhopali day. The Bhopal Gothic, in its discourse of injurability, points less to the bodies of the victim than to the embedding of these bodies in specifically dangerous settings and environs haunted by a toxic past. That is, the Bhopal Gothic of toxic haunting, specters of destruction, secrecy and repression is cathected or invested with emotional energy onto human bodies and the body politic, both of which are thereby rendered precarious. Precarious subjects, individuals, constitute the precariat public sphere in Bhopal, even 30 years after the disaster. Bhopal instantiates a precarious cultural condition in its texts from 1984 to the present. What Nayar seems to be emphasizing in this passage is the idea that the physical environment of one specific place in the world, Bhopal, has come to represent not only toxicity, but precarity itself. Cultural texts such as literature, film, and photography play a particular role in reinforcing the cultural function of Bhopal, reminding society <clears throat> of the specters of destruction created by certain kinds of industrial activity. There is also, of course, a social justice aspect to the Bhopal story, just as there is in the case of COVID-19. Nayar turns to theorist Judith Butler's 2004 book, precarious life, the powers of mourning and violence, to emphasize the fact that some, quote, some lives are rendered more precarious, unlivable, and their deaths less grievable than of others, end quote. I realize we are currently in the midst of the COVID pandemic. The experience has not receded into history. And yet, even in the heart of this experience, as our minds adjust to the new reality, there is a danger that we might become increasingly complacent and numb to the perils of the world, including the potential for even more expansive contagion. 
This is especially the case when we cannot see the danger around us. The sheer invisibility of the threat leads to insensitivity and, as Nayar describes it in the case of Bhopal, a kind of repression of knowledge and awareness. In the section of the book Bhopal's Ecological Gothic titled Apprehension, Recognition, and the Repressed, Nayar points to the fact that a lot of information about the 1984 incident was secreted away in files and communications controlled by Union Carbide of India Limited and government officials. He refers to the idea of secret information and ambiguous information as a kind of textual uncanny, that's his phrase, textual uncanny, by which there is a societal repression of the information necessary for the public to remember and care about events like Bhopal. The alternative to repression is apprehension or the cognitive grasping of a phenomenon or an experience. Judith Butler writes that apprehension is a form of knowing bound up with sensing or perceiving. We face a similar predicament with regard to our efforts to grasp and appreciate the meaning of the current pandemic, as much of the experience of the pandemic is hidden away in hospitals, the data secreted in government databases that are minimally available to the public. I don't know what the situation is in India regarding the availability of COVID information, but in the US, the government has been actively suppressing information in an appalling way I've never seen previously, firing or otherwise silencing government officials who try to go public with information the administration deems detrimental to reopening the economy. Much of what Nayar claims about the secrecy related to the Bhopal accident and the efforts of subsequent journalists artists and writers to reveal secret information feels eerily relevant to the current experience we're all facing with regard to the pandemic. I wanted to mention too, the compelling conclusion Nayar offers in his book on Bhopal, in which he discusses Raghu Rai's photograph, Burial of an Unknown Child, analyzing the visual rhetoric of the image, which shows a hand appearing to brush dirt and stones from the face of a small child whose body is otherwise covered. As we look ahead to future textual representations of the pandemic we're now living through, we might stay alert to the use of jarring visual and narrative rhetoric of this kind, in which the normalcy and peril of our present moment might be captured. Nayar describes the dissonant, uncanny pairing of decorum and the grotesque captured in Rai's photograph as follows. He writes, there is a certain tenderness with which the hand brushes the mud and the and gravel around the face, the child's face and head. The tenderness standing as a sharp contrast to the horrors of the 2nd and 3rd of December, 1984, is gut-wrenching because it also signals a delicacy, a propriety toward the dead child, which the child was possibly never accorded in the moments of dying. There is, in the act captured in the photograph, a fantasy or illusion of decorum, which Bhopal did not possess or exhibit in the course of the disaster, nor was it allowed the victims or survivors. However, in the bleached, staring eyes of the dead child, the anonymity of identity sits oddly with delicacy and propriety, the delicacy and propriety of the brushing hand. I suggest that what arrests us is this very conjunction of the delicate and proper with the grotesque. The image of the respected, dignified body being treated with care is an odd reminder of the sheer grotesque nature of the deaths of Bhopal, everted or contorted physiologies, choking and coughing to death." End quote. By exploring the aesthetic, ethical, rhetorical, and psychological nuances of textual representations of vulnerability in the context of the 1984 industrial disaster in Bhopal, Pramod Nayar offers a blueprint for how we might begin to understand the current public health crisis 
that is not confined to a single city or region on the planet, but is shared across continents and nations. The global dimension of the COVID pandemic is strikingly different than the Bhopal story, but in some ways, even a seemingly place-focused industrial disaster is actually more widespread than it might seem at first glance. Representative as it is of a broader risk posed by modern technology and global capitalism. Nayar was clearly thinking of the psychology and aesthetics of precarity in a much broader context than the Bhopal story alone. When he was working on the 2017 volume, as he shortly thereafter published the 2019 book, Eco Precarity, Vulnerable Lives in Literature and Culture, which argues that the precariat, those who experience precarity, include not only diverse human beings, but non-human subjects. He argues that ecological disaster and eco-apocalypse, along with different states of eco-precarity, are central to contemporary environmentality. Environmentality is the term Lawrence Buell used in 2005 to describe the modes through which literary and cultural texts from cinema to fiction engage with ecological issues and concerns. This particular focus of the book Eco Precarity, uh, the particular focus is the contingent nature of the earth, what Nayar calls the beauty, fragility, and singularity of the planet we inhabit, which we stand to lose if we do not take care of our only home. In Eco Precarity, Nayar ventures into the territory of a project I'm currently working on with my colleagues Swarnalata Rangaranjan from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras and Vidya Sarveswaran from IIT Jodhpur. A handbook to medical environmental human book, uh, humanities that will include 30 chapters by scholars from throughout the world attempting to understand various connections between human health and the external world, and also exploring the health and vulnerability of the non-human realm from the perspective of illness, injury, and well-being. Just as Pramod Nayar was able easily to adapt his analysis of human precarity to the broader planetary context in moving from Bhopal's ecological Gothic to the more recent book, Eco Precarity, there have long been efforts to use the rubric of health and medicine to characterize human interactions with nature. The idea is used, some might say, co-opted by an organization called Healing the Earth, Incorporated that seeks to advance the health, uh, this is a quote, advance the health and natural wealth of our planet through investments that directly benefit the environment, the emerging green economy, and our shareholders, end quote. In recent months, a number of news organizations have also used the medical metaphor to describe what's happening environmentally as a result of the current pandemic such as an April 20th, 2020 video titled, Is COVID-19 Healing the Earth? When Swarnalata, Vidya, and I approached potential contributors to the Medical Environmental Humanities Handbook, we invited them to explore human and planetary health in ways that go beyond the loose symbolic idea of health in human and non-human contexts using theories of disease, disrepair, treatment, recovery, and physical and mental well-being from various cultures around the world. Some 30 contributors will discuss the use of narrative medicine as a way of revealing the plight of victims of contaminated environments, the theories of embodiment that reveal the experience of prosthetic limb users, the complex environmental entanglements of multiple chemical sensitivity patients and the linkages between mental illness and geographical displacement, among many other medical and environmental topics. Cultural lenses on the conjunctions between human health and the natural world range from Sufi folk music from Turkey to Ayurvedic philosophy from India. The central goal of the project is to show how our ecological predicament, toxic land, water, and air, loss of species, diminished access 
to water and other resources needed for survival and a changing climate that will fundamentally disrupt human life and many other life forms on the planet. Um, this ecological predicament or, or collection of predicaments is a simultaneous threat to human health. <clears throat> the special challenge in this project, I think, is to go beyond superficial analogies between human health and planetary health, which abound in popular culture. We have only begun to receive uh, the actual chapter manuscripts for the book, but so far the contributors seem to be doing a very good job of addressing the psychological and physical connections between environmental conditions and human health. Let me point to a few examples that I have at hand right now. Professor Jaru Chang from Brooklyn College in New York has drafted an essay titled, We Are All in This Together, COVID Pathology, Scapegoat, and Hope, which seeks to understand COVID pathology from a range of perspectives, not only the biophysical perspective. She writes, we can see COVID uh, pathology encompasses a wide range of pathological conditions, from biological infection from the virus and mental trauma to abnormal social behavior triggered by the pandemic. This chapter zooms in on the prevalent racist and xenophobic attacks during the COVID pandemic and frames them as an example of social ideological COVID pathology. As a self-defense and coping strategy, an individual or community tends to find something or somebody to blame, either as a divine cosmic plot, e.g. Satan's work, or mundanely, more mundanely, uh, a political conspiracy theory. One of the most dangerous ideological pathologies is blaming and prompting hate crimes and violence against cultural and non-human others for the outbreak and mishandling of disease, end quote. As a Taiwanese scholar of Chinese culture living in the United States, Chang is particularly sensitive to the anti-Chinese response in this country as a way of scapegoating people associated with the country where COVID-19 originated. She refers to this as a form of eco-fascism, which is an aberrant and dangerous social pathology. Chang is also a specialist in critical animal studies, very sensitive to the relationships between humans and other species. So an important part of her study is also the section called Blaming the Animal Other, where she focuses on the zoonotic aspects of COVID, the fact that the disease is likely to have been transferred to humans from another animal species. She writes, just as there is a reactionary game of blaming and stigmatizing infected or potentially infectious human bodies, so animals are not exempt from scapegoating. That is, whenever a zoonotic outbreak occurs, non-human animals are blamed as the cause, even before they are proven guilty, end quote. Professor Chung uses Rene Girard's scapegoat theory to explain the social process by which individuals or groups within society are singled out for undeserved blame and treatment. Representing this as a common but dangerous psychological pathology, a kind of disease, scapegoating as a disease, uh, one that many countries are experiencing at this very moment as a result of the pandemic. The environmental connections in this case result from the fact that the virus may well have originated in another animal species, although to my knowledge that has not yet been verified, and in the fact that certain kinds of animals such as bats and pangolins were quickly identified as the possible villains in allowing <clears throat> uh, the disease to make the leap to human beings. Professor Chang concludes her article with an extended analysis um, and this is where she focuses on her post-COVID hope of what she calls a collective, multicultural, multi-species, post-humanist community. Using post-humanist theory from Rosie Bridati and others to suggest that we might use the pandemic as an opportunity to learn how to coexist with the virus. That's her, her phrase, that we might seek to learn to co how to coexist with the virus. 
She points out, as an example of this, um, a 2012 novel by Chinese writer and physician Bi Xumin titled Coronavirus. It's actually in Chinese, but the English translation is simply Coronavirus. Um, and this was published in 2012, well before the current uh, pandemic, in which B calls for, quote, respect for species place in the web of life and invokes a sense of humility and awe vis-a-vis -vis the virus, end quote. So in the case of this particular study, the medical aspects involve not only the examination of our responses to the current public health crisis, but a consideration of the broader pathology of blaming or scapegoating. The environmental aspect of Professor Chang's study includes our attitudes toward other living beings, uh, as uh, uh, including possible carriers of the COVID virus, such as bats and pangolins. There are a few other chapters uh, for the handbook that also seem especially relevant to the COVID pandemic, such as Turkish scholar Gizem Ilmaz Karahan's essay, Contagious History, the Imagination of Viruses, and French scholar Francoise Besson's uh, article, Disseminating the Seeds of Words to Fight Spreading Diseases, from Albert Camus' La Peste to Tony Hillerman's People of Darkness and the First Eagle. The first articles for the project are just beginning to arrive. Uh, the, the full articles are just beginning to arrive. And the other day I received one from Heather Ramos, a doctoral student at Washington State University in the US titled, Revisiting Lord's Cancer Journals in the 21st Century, Resisting the Silent Passivity Surrounding Slow Violence, Environmental Toxins, and Systemic Racism. This article addresses not only the carcinogenic implications of contaminated physical environments, but the racist social structures and environmental injustice that lead to heightened exposure of particular groups of people, especially people of color, to these toxic environments. Ramos's study, while not focusing on the COVID pandemic, instead addresses the conjunction of the medical and environmental humanities by looking at the planetary crises of toxicity, injustice, and cancer. She shows how author Audre Lorde's 1980 book, Cancer Journals, helped to overcome silent passivity and raise awareness of this environmental and public health crisis. Rather than cataloging the many other articles that will be part of the forthcoming book on the medical environmental humanities, I'd like at this point to stop talking and hear some questions and comments from anyone who's been listening to this talk. What I've tried to suggest is that in various ways, the COVID pandemic and various other crises we're experiencing have led to a broad sense of vulnerability or precarity that all of us are experiencing nowadays to some degree, although certainly some people are much more vulnerable than others. I've also tried to probe a little bit the strange, even paradoxical combination of normalcy and peril that we're experiencing as we accustom ourselves to the new normal of the risky pandemic world. And I've attempted to sketch out, at least briefly, the possibility of bringing together an interest in human, physical, and mental health and our environmental concerns. This latter approach seems to be a valuable new approach um, new perspective in interdisciplinary humanities research and maybe one of the ways that the humanities can contribute something meaningful during a time of planetary crisis. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Slavik, for this very, very illuminating uh, talk. Uh, I have just a few queries since I've been as a moderator listening to you. And uh, uh, one would be you began with your uh, idea that, uh, you know, you said that this is imagining a post-coronavirus world. And uh, there where we move on to thinking about the psychological implications and the options. I mean, uh, could you elaborate on that? I mean, that issue or that topic? Yeah, well, 
Thank you. Um, the idea of a post-corona, by imagining a post-coronavirus world, that was the theme of the conference that I spoke at in, in uh, May. We were supposed to uh, try to think of some takeaways, some um, lessons that we might learn from the current crisis. Remember, a, a lot has happened in four months. The severity of the crisis has greatly deepened. It, it has spread much more widely, many more infections, uh, many more deaths. Um, the seriousness of the, the, the medical aspect of the crisis has become much more plainly clear to us during the past four months. Um, and uh, so back then, uh, we, all those of us who spoke, about 30 of us, were trying to look ahead to a time when the crisis might end, the pandemic might end, imagining whether you know, we would learn some lessons from the situation we're in now that would continue to be useful to human society in the future. Um, so, well, one of the things that I suggested is that the pandemic or the, the meaning, the, the psychological and emotional meaning of the pandemic might never actually end. And in fact, you know, the medical professionals that I speak to even now um, suggest that we will never actually be free from the, from the virus itself. There will always be uh, you know, the COVID-19 virus and we may be able to insulate ourselves from it with certain medications and treatment protocols, but it's not as if we will erase the virus from our lives. Um, but I was suggesting that we might learn something psychologically. We might develop what I was calling COVID mind uh, as a way of thinking in new ways with new intensity about um, particularly this idea that all of us are vulnerable. It's not only um, you know, certain unlucky people who are, uh, happen to live in a certain part of the world or who for other reasons are exposed to the virus. Um, pretty much everyone on the planet is vulnerable. And this is a valuable lesson I was trying to suggest that in many ways beyond COVID-19, we're vulnerable to conditions that we're producing on the planet. And this sensitivity to our own vulnerability might lead us to behave more carefully. Um, you know, how we interact with other species, um, how we um, you know, use carbon-based fuels even um, and, and produce precarity of other kinds, not disease precarity necessarily, but certainly global climate change is resulting in a lot of uh, conditions that are very dangerous to us. And a sense of our vulnerability or precarity might guide us to behave more mindfully and more carefully. And that's what I was trying to suggest well beyond the time when all of us are in lockdown and you know worrying because there's no vaccine for the coronavirus well beyond this into the future we might potentially carry with us a sense of this vulnerability or precarity and that would be a good thing i'm arguing thank you for that response professor uh, uh, may I move on while you were referring to Professor Anayar, you talked about, you know, the idea of the gothic or a feeling of disquiet in art and literature that was being portrayed. I mean, as uh, uh, future researchers, you know, how do we put these ideas together, say, in uh, looking into art and literature? I mean, could you elaborate a little more? I mean, say, yeah, well, about the ideas. Yeah, uh, so... Uh, Professor Nayar was arguing that there's a particular subgenre of Gothic culture, Gothic textuality associated with the uh, terrible industrial accident in, in Bhopal in 1984, that in the past 30 some years, um, an actual uh, field of, of uh, literature and art has emerged, a, a very specific type of Gothic uh, uh, cultural textuality uh, inspired by, you know, the, uh, the the event of 1984. Likewise, I would say there's there are other sub traditions of uh, disaster culture, disaster textuality, um, such as Chernobyl literature and art. And um, there is a, there are films and and novels and 
and works of nonfiction, etc., inspired specifically by the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl in, uh, I believe it was 1986. Um, and so there, uh, this idea is that, I guess, certain aspects or permutations of the Gothic um, uh, aspects of the, this type of discourse, Gothic discourse, uh, are very suitable for the representation of um, you know how we f feel about particular disasters that have occurred in the world. Um, uh, not only, I would say, associated with human technological activities, such as the chemical accident in, in Bhopal and the nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, but um, perhaps even COVID-19 will inspire its own tradition of literature and art. Certainly, a lot of people these days are reading pandemic literature, literature about plagues, disease. Um, I mentioned the article by Yilmaz um, um, uh, in uh, Turkey, a uh, young scholar who's writing about viruses in literature. In, uh, looking much more broadly than the pandemic, but um, this the whole notion of um, the, the representation of viruses in artistic texts, I think is inspired by our current predicament it, during the COVID pandemic. Um, and I don't know, maybe some of you have also been spending time watching virus-related film or, can, or contagion-related film or reading such literature. I'm currently reading a 2011 novel um, by an American author named Peter Heller called The Dog Stars, which is about an influenza pandemic that seems to have taken place in modern times. It's not, it's not um, speculative fiction looking towards some distant future. It seems to be set pretty much in the present, so it's very realistic. And he's um, the, the protagonist in this novel is one of the few people remaining uh, in the contemporary United States, he, it's as if um, people have simply been erased from the landscape and he uh, travels around, he flies a small plane and he looks down watching for any other people, um, not because he wants to join them and, and you know, be mutually supportive, but because he feels other people are a threat. They will come after him and try to take what he has um, you know, it's a very Darwinian um, situation described in that novel. Um, and yet also there's a lot of beauty. You know, the planet is beautiful. The, the environment is beautiful. And this author um, or the protagonist in that novel seems to exist in this strange paradoxical condition that I was describing in my talk of celebrating the beauty of the world and the fact that he's still alive and also feeling deeply threatened um, not particularly by the influenza virus, but by other other human beings, other survivors who might come after him um, and uh, attack him somehow. So uh, that's one example of the kind of uh, plague literature that I've been reading. It, it has some of these Gothic tendencies and some of these paradoxical characteristics that I described earlier, you know, uh, by way of Nayar's work. Um, so these curious combinations of, of um, psychological responses seem to be one of the elements of the literature and art that are emerging from these um, situations that we're experiencing, the, the, you know, the, the uh, uh, contemporary struggle such as the, the COVID pandemic. So I guess what I'm saying is we might try to stay open to new emerging literary traditions that come directly out of some of these dramatic, um, disconcerting um, experiences that we're having. Um, and in fact, you know, some of us who are producing new literature or new art, we may in fact find ourselves being inspired to innovate and create um, somewhat new artistic modes in response to these experiences. Uh, thank you, Professor, for taking that bit fully. Uh, one more question from on my part, and then there are actually questions waiting in the chat box. So uh, just a clarification, you were also referring to Judith Butler and her uh, idea of the alternative to repression as apprehension. 
I mean, uh, so so would you elaborate a little on that as to what do we mean by an apprehension? Yeah, I. Th um, well, I think that when I quoted Judith Butler in that context, I was referring specifically to the idea that that to apprehend um, um, vulnerability often requires using the physical senses in a way we've evolved to to see things and to hear and and otherwise perceive a threat. And this this is the the nature of our uh, physical evolution that that we we tend to rely heavily on our senses, um, and yet it's very easy to well either intentionally um, for you know uh, corporations or governments to hide information about threats or about the causes of certain disasters such as the Bhopal accident, um, and so um, the way Nayara uses Judith Butner's work in relation to repression and apprehension is to suggest that, that um, you know, at, at this point, the Bhopal accident occurred so long ago that most of us would have no direct access to the experience. We, we would not find it easy to meet people who were there and, and suffered the horrors of that event. And I would uh, wager that most people in the world were not in or near Bhopal at the time. So we have no sensory access to that. And so if if the government or if Union Carbide are, are concealing or secreting away that information, then then we can't apprehend it any longer. We lose touch with the incident and we, we find it extremely challenging to care about it. What I tried, to, the connection I tried to make between that idea and our current situation with the COVID pandemic is the fact that, um, you know, for many people I know, um, the pandemic is strangely abstract. It's strangely abstract. We read about it in the media or we listen to news reports about the pandemic. Um, to be honest, I, I, no person, only well, only a, a one person I know in another country has actually had a bout with COVID and, and actually contracted it. Otherwise, I, I don't personally know anyone who has contracted the COVID virus. It's a kind of abstraction for me, even though I read the numbers uh, you know, in in the, the newspaper or on the internet, um, and so, but but uh, the danger is that there may be certain um, government forces that, for political reasons, are trying not to make this information available to us. The information gathered by public health officials. Certainly, we fear that this is the case in the United States, where, for political reasons, our current regime wants to have a an open and vibrant economy, and fears that that the a COVID lockdown would would undermine the economy and undermine the administration's efforts to be reelected for another term. So they have strong political reasons to try to suppress information, which and and prevent the public from apprehending the true severity of the pandemic. Um, so I think I, what I was trying to do is extrapolate from Nayar's comments about Bhopal uh, culture um, and the psychology of that incident um, to the current situation with the COVID pandemic. Um, and that, I think, is one of the ways that we try to use some of this scholarship, not just to think about the, the uh, situation or the history that is the direct subject matter of a, a study like like Nayar's 2017 book on Bhopal, but actually to extrapolate from that and try to connect it to other situations, including our current uh, predicament with the pandemic. Did you say there were some other questions in the chat box? No, I haven't Thank used it. Yeah, please Hello. go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Slovic, for such an engaging and informative lecture. Yes, there are certain questions in the chat box. Uh, if you could uh, address those, I am reading those out. Okay. There is a question from 
Anuprita, Anuprita Chatterjee, and she asked, how do we use visual images to generate awareness? Uh, that is a huge topic. Um, I, I mean, there, there have been many studies of this. Um, and um, actually, I, I, some of you might be interested in a book that I uh, wrote and co-edited with my father, who's a well-known psychologist named Paul Slovic. Uh, in 2015, we published the book Numbers and Nerves, Information, Emotion, and Meaning in a World of Data. And there are several articles in that book about the use of visual imagery um, as a way of uh, breaking through psychic numbing, the numbness that occurs when we're given abstract data full of technical jargon and um, numbers, pure, large numbers are, are related to um, victims or, or other kinds of damage caused uh, by a, a problem. And um, I mean, a lot of it, the, the visual imagery has a particular salience or power when it can reduce a large and abstract phenomenon to a singular uh, example. Um, and one of the examples uh, um, that we write about is the case of uh, the refugee crisis in the Middle East, you know, where um, many thousands of people uh, have fled, um, for instance, the civil war in Syria. And, and tried in very dangerous circumstances to make their way through Turkey and then across the Aegean Sea to Europe. Um, and for many months, there were news stories about large numbers of Syrian refugees and their difficult circumstances and their struggles. Um, and the general public um, around the world was not paying a lot of attention to this story until uh, one uh, three-year-old um, sadly, um, lost his life, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, and, and uh, drowned in the ocean and washed up on the beach in Turkey. And a photograph was taken of this boy named Elon Kurdi. It was published in the New York Times in September 2015. And that particular image was so poignant, so in it's so individualized and made concrete the refugee crisis that there was an enormous increase of attention to the refugee crisis and also uh, charitable donations greatly increased as a result of that poignant image. And uh, this is a book that I've been reading lately. It's called Compassion Fatigue. It was published in 1999 um, by a scholar of journalism. Uh, her name is um, Susan Moeller. Uh, and the subtitle is How the Media Sell Disease, Famine, War, and Death. And it's a, so this book, Compassion Fatigue, uh, addresses the fact that um, we tend to lose our sensitivity to uh, phenomena um, that sh we think should evoke compassion, empathy, um, and sometimes simply attention. But over time, we become uh, weary of uh, paying such attention, we, we become fatigued and we lose our sharp attention to these issues or phenomena. And often imagery will uh, trigger a strong emotional response that will enable us to, to bring our minds back into attention to the details of that subject. So it's usually not enough merely to have a strong emotional response. We also need to think analytically about the situation and, and um, determine what, what proper policies or behaviors would be in response. So uh, visual imagery often is very good at evoking an emotional reaction and calling us to attention, but then we need to follow up uh, upon that, that immediate emotional response with this more um, rational. I hope that's helpful. Um, what are some other questions? Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, you, you're right. Uh, in this uh, pandemic situation, we too also uh, saw such visual images, uh, which uh, like of our migrant laborers trying to return home. And that was really a kind of an emotional moment for all of us. Uh, there are actually two questions from uh, my colleague, Mr. Rohan Hassan, and he asked, the first question is, 
Do you believe that the rise in totalitarian states all around the globe with their biopolitical functioning is leading steadily to this condition of eco-precarity? And should I read the second one as well? Um, I think, um, let me, it'll be hard for me to remember both of them. Let okay. me, um, Hmm. Let, okay. let me try to respond to that first question first, okay. um, I, and I'll try to give slightly shorter answers because I, I want to be able to get through these and and not have people waiting too long. Um, I I do think there's a danger in the um, rise in totalitarian regimes, um, especially if these regimes are working closely with um, you know certain. Um, uh, corporations and industries that are primarily interested in making a lot of money, which is the goal of corporations, um, and not in protecting uh, the natural world or or public health. And it, so, if the totalitarian regimes are working hand in hand with with big extractive industry, um, for instance, I would say the petroleum industry, then there really is the danger that that um, human and non-human lives will become more precarious. For instance, I'm thinking of, of the um, American administration's recent decision to open up oil drilling in the far northern part of Alaska, the, what's called the Arctic National Wildlife Range, which has been a very sacred area protected by by public policy, and the, the current administration is so closely connected to the oil industry that they're risking tremendously. The people who live up there, uh, to, uh, large numbers of, of wild species, um, it's potentially a devastating um, uh, what um, collaboration between a, a quasi-totalitarian regime in the United States. It would be, our, our regime, I, I would argue, would like to be totalitarian if, if the American public allowed it to be so, um, and with the oil industry. So, so I, yes, I feel there's a great risk in the rise in totalitarianism. What's the next question? Uh, so his next question is, do you believe that the proliferation in zombie literature and movies is directly related to the concerning notion of eco precarity. That's a really good question, and I, you know, in in my field of eco criticism, uh, as I attend conferences, I start to see more and more scholars in eco criticism and the environmental humanities talking about zombie literature and film um, as a response, um, if if not to eco precarity per se, then at least to um, environmental degradation um, and its direct impacts on, on human health. Um, so I'm not really an expert in, in zombie culture myself, but I do think that's a, a great area of study. And uh, I, I think the not only the proliferation of the, of the art form, but a, a, an increase in the number of um, audience members, people who like reading that literature or watching such films, um, suggest that people sense some kind of truth or valuable meaning in that literature because it accords with the sense of our, our, our being threatened. Um, and maybe that, well, I don't want to belabor this too long, but you know, zombies are like ordinary humans who, who then turn evil and dangerous. And this has something, there's something gothic about that, right? The ordinary becomes extraordinary and dangerous. And, and so the gothic dimension of zombie culture may very well reflect this uncanniness that Nayar writes about in his own treatment of the disaster um, um, gothic. So uh, yeah, I think it's great to bring up that um, subculture of, of gothic or of a uh, zombie text in this uh, context. Thank you. Next. Uh, there is a question from Padmanabh Trivedi, and uh, her question is: Do religions, especially Hinduism, have potential to provide values for constituting a new approach to ecological studies 
as they emphasize the integration of mind, society, and the environment in one single way. What's your take on that? Uh, I, I think that would be a great use of religion, a very noble, a noble and socially beneficial use of religion. So I, I, I do agree that that religion has that potential. Um, Hinduism and many other religions um, have ecological thinking embedded in them. In fact, there's an entire there, in the 1990s there was a series of of symposia at Harvard University on world religions and the environment. And they produced a book, a, you know, a thick book of essays uh, from each of these symposia at Harvard, um, uh, focusing on the ways different religious traditions highlight ecological thinking. Um, and, and I would say pro-social or socially uh, positive behavior. So I, I very much agree with the sentiment of this question. And I think that no one religion uh, has a monopoly on the best ecological thinking that, again, these, these lines of thinking exist pretty much in every religious tradition I've heard about. Um, so there, there's been quite a lot of research on this, and I, I, for myself, I would be very happy to see more emphasize, emphasis among religious leaders in uh, positive environmental thinking um, and in, in teaching the public to use religion to help us be more aware of, of our relationship to the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. There's a question from my student, uh, Sahil Akram Sheikh, and he asks, as earlier, there were certain out other outbreaks of viral or bacterial infections, such as the Ebola virus outbreak in Western Africa, due to close quarters interaction between humans and animal inhabitation. Don't you think we must create a demarketing line between our human and animal inhabitation? Uh, thank you. Um, um, how exactly would we do this? Um, I, I'm not quite sure how we would create a, a strict boundary between ourselves and, and other species. Um, I suppose one way of doing this might be to um, be more careful in how we expand our urban communities, um, at least in in the western United States where I live, we tend to have a, a problem with urban sprawl. Um, you know, our, our people tend to live further and further out from cities in the countryside or even in relatively wild areas where other species uh, have have maintained their habitat. So, urban sprawl and the expansion of the human footprint into Animal to animal habitat leads us to have encounters, not just the spread of disease um, and the zoonotic spread of disease, but in various other cases, humans have, have run into problems um, because they're living in places that are inhabited by, uh, you know, mountain lions where I live or wolves or other animals that need those places for themselves. So I, I do think we can be a little bit cautious with urban sprawl. Um, yeah, you know, the, many of the concerns related to the COVID pandemic, as I'm sure a lot of you know, have to do with, um, you know, the, the, the way in Chinese culture, many kinds of animals are, are consumed um, through certain uh, markets that trade in wild species. Um, and um, that's where people might have encountered bats and pangolins and various other um, animals that, that carry certain viruses. So I guess perhaps by trying, if possible, in a culturally sensitive way to limit the and change our treatment of, of wild animals, as in the case of the Chinese markets, we might very well actually protect people from exposure to certain types of disease. So our treatment of other animals is part of this, and also our use of land and where we locate human activities and human human um, kind of uh, uh, inhabitation, um, that could perhaps protect us
from some of these unwanted uh, effects. So uh, it, it's a complicated social and political issue, but I think it's very much worth talking about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There's one final question by Sheikh Tariqali, and he asks, would you please say something about the growing cyclone vulnerabilities and its non-representation in literature? Why is it that despite the increasing number of tropical cyclones in recent years, cyclone vulnerabilities have much smaller presence in contemporary literary fiction than they do even in public discussion? Um, hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I haven't myself made a specific study of the representation of cyclones. Um, and I think um, maybe the, so cyclones I believe would be kind of the, the uh, specific version of hurricanes. We, we do in the Atlantic, um, the Caribbean and Atlantic oceans, we have m major storms that we call hurricanes. And uh, I, I mean, it would be an interesting question to pursue to see whether there really is a diminishment of um, cultural representation or artistic representation of these mega storms. One of the books that I've written about in recent years is, is called um, Odds, Odds Against Tomorrow, as I recall, Odds Against Tomorrow by Nathaniel Rich. And it is actually a hurricane related book. Uh, it was published around 2010, 2011, <clears throat> about a huge storm that hits New York City. And the main character is um, a kind of mathematician who looks at data and predicts disaster. And he he works for a, a kind of insurance company, and he he predicts a huge storm that will strike uh, New York City, and no one believes him. It's a kind of what we might call a Cassandra story. There's a the Greek mythological character of Cassandra is someone who was given the gift of seeing the future, but she also had her tongue removed so she could not speak. So the Cassandra um, complex is to have a great vision but not be able to communicate it. And essentially that's what Nathaniel Rich's character in Odds Against Tomorrow has that he has this vision of a tremendous storm, but struggles to communicate it in a way that convinces his listeners. So that's one example of a hurricane-related text. Um, but I, I think that's a very interesting idea to look at storm literature, um, which is so closely connected to global climate change. Um, but I, And I would say, while looking at storm literature, I would also recommend looking for drought literature. The two sort of the two, uh, two extremes of um, climate, devastate, climate, climate change caused devastation would be excessive water in tremendous rainstorms uh, and the wind and sea, uh, sea rise of uh, cyclones and hurricanes, and then tremendous heat and drought in other regions. Um, and I think they're two sides of the same coin related to the impacts of climate change. But I think that's a great area for further research uh, and would encourage you to pursue that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I now pass on to Shamishta, ma'am, to conclude the session. Ma'am? Thank you, uh, Sina. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I would uh, once again thank Professor uh, Slovic for uh, this very illuminating talk and this uh, question answer session. Uh, so indeed you have uh, highlighted uh, for us the ways in which we could engage ourselves uh, in this uh, during these catastrophic times and how we could go towards probably healing. Uh, how our future, future research, uh, researchers probably as scholars of humanities uh, could lead into something more meaningful, whereas we uh, contribute something to the world uh, and the practical uh, living of human beings. 
Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. And we look forward to associating with you in future. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank for, you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks to all of you for listening and for your comments. Okay. Okay, have thank a good you. day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day too. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.